Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that is good enough to take your breath away. Here is the captain. That's right. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And God darn it, people like me. It's good to be seen. and It's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very excited to be featuring Run, Julius, Run by our friends, the great folks and magnificent brewers at Tactical Brewing Company in Orlando, Florida. Run, Julius, Run is an incredibly delicious orange Julius New England India Pale Ale with vanilla and oranges. Just absolutely amazing. Garage grade five out of five bottle caps. And here's some cheers to our friends that helped us out with this week's shows first up a big cheers to Kristen in st anthony newfoundland canada a big cheers to melissa in fort myers florida and last but certainly not least we have sarah and carmel by the sea california everyone we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and helped us out with this week's beer run and for that we thank you yeah b w double r u n beer run make sure you go to our website sign up on our mailing list because we we send you news what's in the know if we got some new merchandise or if we're gonna do a live event or sometimes we just send you a promo code so you can get a discount on the store page but either way it's a great way to support the show sign up on our mailing list today at truecrimegarage.com colonel that's enough of the business all right everybody gather around grab a chair grab a beer let's talk some true crime Mike Anderson talked with him about his concerns the case could get lost in the shadow of Gabby Petito's disappearance. Sean Paul Schulte says it's hard not to consider the kind of attention that Gabby Petito's case got when compared with that of his daughter, Kylan Schulte and Crystal Turner. And he's asking people to remember that their killer is still out there. For the past three weeks, Sean Paul Schulte has been right here. There's a spot where I would sit and wait for the girls 
Uh, they'd come around the corner on the Harley and come rolling up. A sentimental spot at Swanee City Park where he's maintained a booth for collecting tips from the community. These clues are time sensitive and now so much time has gone by. And while Petito's case grabbed so much more attention, he doesn't begrudge it. He just believes other cases like his daughter's need that same focus. I, I know what it's like to have someone missing and I know what it's like to... Not have closure yet, so I really feel for Gabby's family. And hard as it may be several weeks later, he's asking people who passed through the Moab area between August 13th through 18th to consider what they might have seen in the area near LaSalle Loop Road where the two women were shot and killed. If anybody saw anything there, a vehicle, a description of a person, uh, a person with a dog, um, a weirdo with a gun, whatever it is. Schulte says dozens of people have brought him clues, and through his time here in town, he's seen how much Kylin and Crystal were loved. The town cherished those girls. And the Grand County Sheriff's Office says they continue to follow leads in this case and have even called on additional labs and technicians to go over the troves of potential evidence, and they say that could still take months to complete. John Paul Schulte was the anxious parent you heard in the clip from KSL News there. His daughter, Kylan, age 24, had been out of touch for days. This was totally unlike her, but Sean Paul lived in Montana. His daughter was missing in Utah, hardly a hop, skip, and a jump away. When Sean got worried, he started calling people who knew Kylan, hoping to round some people up to get some help going to find his daughter. Both Kylan and her wife, Crystal, were no call, no shows at work two days in a row now, which was unheard of from the young women. When there was no trace of the women, Sean Paul reported his daughter and Crystal missing to Moab police on the 16th of August. The following day, August 17th, 2021, the father of Kylan Schulte, posted a panicked message on Facebook that read, Kylan and Crystal are missing. They must be in the silver Kia van because the black van and Harley are at McDonald's. Please help look for my girls or their Kia. Haven't been to work. Haven't called. Not in hospital. Not in Moab jail. Please have an ATL out. Little did the frantic father know that by the time he posted this message, it was far, far too late. So we have this situation here, Captain, where on the 16th of August, he reports that his daughter and her wife are missing. The following day is the 17th of August, 2021, when he posts that frantic message to his Facebook. Now, on this same day, we're going to have him reaching out to persons that he knows in the area that know both of the girls to help him kind of keep an eye on things from afar. And maybe somebody can find one or both of the girls who have been missing for some time now. But unfortunately, unfortunately, what we would end up learning later is that a double murder had taken the life of his daughter and her partner. This really began one of the most bizarre crimes in recent memory in the peaceful area of Moab, Utah. So on August 17th, we have Sean who speaks with speaks via phone with Cindy Sue Hunter to check in. Cindy was Kylan's boss and also a longtime friend of both Kylan and her wife, Crystal. Sean Paul knew her as well. Cindy was a longtime family friend. Sean Paul Schulte was begging people in Utah to help find his girls. Sean Paul told Cindy that no one that he had talked to had seen Kylan or Crystal and maybe up to three days. And Cindy had some more bad news for him. Kylan had not shown up for work the day before on the 16th. She assured him that she would personally go looking for the women and get back to him with some answers very soon. 
So on August 18th, Cindy goes over to the McDonald's where Crystal worked. This is might be a little confusing, but it's all quite simple, actually. Cindy is the boss for Kylan. She works at a business that is very near this McDonald's where Crystal worked. And she knows both of the girls, obviously. And so she goes over to the McDonald's. She's asking, has Crystal been in since the last time we spoke? The co-worker of Crystal tells Cindy, no, Crystal had not been to work that day, the day before, or in several days. Of course, this is all a very bad sign. Not what Cindy was hoping to hear. You know, you know, these girls are missing. You're hoping that it's something simple. You show up to the work and boom, somebody says Crystal is here or was here since you last been here. And just to put some perspective here, Kylan was 24 at the time and Crystal was 38 at this time. And this is really bad news for Cindy because Crystal just didn't blow off work as a rule. And remember, Crystal's wife, Kylan, worked for Cindy and Kylan didn't just blow off work as well. So these are neither of them had shown up for their shifts over the past few days and neither had called their employees for time off or for an excused absence. There's no communication with either of the missing ladies. And we know when someone goes missing, there are unfortunately these natural progressions of things, right? At first you think, oh, this is simply a misunderstanding. We just can't get in touch with that person especially when you're talking about an adult or in this case, two adults and two adults that are pretty free spirited people at that. But that's why their ages to me are important because if a two 18 year olds blew off work and maybe went, you know, on a vacation spree or something that that would make more sense. But somebody that's 24 and somebody that's 38 is less likely to just leave their job and, and leave their security just to go, you know, missing. Yeah. And then you hear everyone saying that they're free spirited ladies. Well, free spirited or not, these, neither of them, neither of these people miss work. And that's one thing that we're told time and time again about each. So the concern level is high, of course. Yes. It's threat level midnight. Cindy is trying to figure out what's going on. So she goes out to the parking lot and notes the Ford Econoline van and the Harley motorcycle that we've that we already referenced from his Facebook post, the father's Facebook post. But the Ford Econoline van and the Harley motorcycle that belonged to Crystal and Kylan were parked at the McDonald's parking lot. Right, but only one of the ladies works at McDonald's. Correct. Right. Now, so so ahead. we have they have more than one vehicle. They have this van they have the motorcycle and they have another vehicle. They have a Kia. So, but it's pretty strange that two of the vehicles that they own are parked at one of their works. No, actually this was not unusual at all. The couple often left one or more of the vehicles in that's a public lot over there. Right. And so they would com- they would commonly leave one or more of their vehicles in that public lot while they used another mode of transportation. So that's why the father's saying, well, they must be in their Kia right. because these two, the Harley and the Econoline van are both parked at the McDonald's. And in fact, at times during the year, they would live out of the larger van, sometimes in these public lots. So while it's not so concerning because this is typical behavior, but you know that people are looking for them and when locating their vehicles and just seeing them sitting there, sitting there for days you're hoping you're hoping to find vehicles or any kind of lead to lead you to the people that are missing. And these vehicles sitting there is of no help to to finding either girl. Well, like you said, they live out of the Econa line, but is that their travel vehicle? That I don't know. Right, right. We have two people using three vehicles total. They they're living out of these vans at some times of the year. You kind of picture like a nomadic lifestyle, right? But they they've both worked at these jobs for a considerable amount of time. Right. Now, so Cindy's still looking for the ladies. She packed up some water, snacks, supplies, and her three dogs. She gets into her car. She drives out to LaSalle's, which is a large mountain range that is a very popular hiking and camping destination. This is just outside of Moab. Sean Paul told Cindy, 
his friend Cindy that the police had carried out some cursory searches of the mainstream campgrounds in LaSalle's. But he knew that his daughter and her wife, that they were known to camp in locations that were more off of the beaten path, right? So we need somebody to check these other locations that they might be camping at. And Cindy told the Times Independent newspaper, quote, we had no idea where they were camped. We didn't know where to look. And Cindy was worried that maybe the women had been in some type of accident, driven off the road, and were stuck somewhere but needed help. She had packed digging tools and blankets in her car just in case that scenario is one that she found them to be in. She basically started driving around to some lesser known campsites or places where people might camp, glancing at ravines and ditches as she did in in case there were, you know, they were in a wreck somewhere. Well, not only that, but I mean, <laughs> there's, there's hiking grounds. There's, there's places that, like you said, people go to camp. And it could be they don't want to be missing. They're not on vacation that they maybe they went somewhere to camp, but they got into an accident or like you said, a car accident or they went hiking and there was an accident when they were hiking. And Cindy's saying, hey, while I'm out there, I'm showing pictures of the women to everyone that I encounter. But that's not a whole lot of people. Eventually heading toward the Sand Flats Road at Lake Warner still looking for the girls. This is where she says that she saw a flash of silver through the trees. She saw a campsite down a little dirt side road. And so she decided to park there. She gets out and she recognized one of the vehicles shared by the women. This was the silver Kia mentioned in the Facebook post, but there are no signs of life other than the pet rabbit named Ruth that Crystal and Kylan took with them everywhere. So the rabbit Ruth is still in her cage. There's a tent set up, but it appeared to be empty. There's a makeshift rabbit shelter that was still in place. So this would have been like some type of setup so that the, they could let the rabbit out, you know, so she could be out of her cage, but not run away. Right. Um, Cindy pulled out her phone she calls the Grand County Sheriff's Office. This is at 11.20 a.m. This is after she told them that she had found the missing vehicle. And they pinned her location so that they could dispatch officers to that location. Yeah, but this is becoming pretty scary and serious. We, we have two missing females, but all their vehicles are accounted for now. And their pet right. as well that they... It's said that they never left this pet alone. So the officers are now en route to that location. Cindy's going to call Sean Paul to let him know that she found the Kia, the missing vehicle. With Sean Paul still on the phone, she's walking around as one does. You know, both the captain and I are known to pace quite a bit when we can be on on the phone, especially when there's a lot going on. And she is walking around this campsite as she's talking to Sean Paul on the phone, bringing him up to speed on everything that she has just found and letting him know that the authorities are on their way out to this campsite. I found their campsite. I found their vehicle. During this conversation, unfortunately, she sees something lying on the ground in the ditch, which is next to the campsite. This catches her eye. And it was... It was Kylan. She was laying in a water-filled ditch, nude from the waist down, riddled with bullet holes, and clearly dead. Her arms and legs were in an awkward position and awkward angles. Cindy shrieked to Sean Paul that, that Kylan was dead. Sean Paul, to his credit, was like, get back in your car roll up your windows now, lock the doors now, get out of there. You need to get out of there. Cindy told the later told the Times Independent that she got in her car and locked the doors and waited for the cops to arrive. So we have these two missing ladies, but who are they? Who are who is Kaylin and who is Crystal? Yes, before we get too far into the the case and the investigation itself to To understand this story, we need a little bit of background, right? 
So let's give some background here on Crystal Michelle Turner and Kylan Carol Schulte. The women had met while Kylan was on a hike with her father, Sean Paul. He later said that at the time, Kylan was depressed. She had had a number of abusive relationships and was, quote, shut down and even contemplated suicide. Then she meets her soulmate, Crystal. And so everything changed for her. And he says, she told me that moving to Moab saved her life, according to her father. The women were truly kindred spirits. They both, they both espoused a life devoid of material things and avoided being tied down to one place. For this reason, they didn't have a home base, preferring what is known as the van life, migrating from campground to campground, living out of tents or their econoline converted to camper van and generally living off the grid in Moab and its surrounding areas. They shared photos on Instagram with hashtag van life and hashtag wife life. They enjoyed flying around on their Harley and hanging out with a close group of artsy and similarly minded friends. But mostly they enjoyed being together, just the two of them. So much so that they married in a treehouse in Hot Springs, Arkansas. This is Crystal's hometown. They got married in April of 2021. Kaylin's family hailed from Billings, Montana, but her father spent some time in Moab, which is how she came to meet Crystal. And as you pointed out, Captain, Kaylin was only 24 when she was killed, but Crystal was 38, and she had lived quite a bit before settling down with Kylan, she had three children of whom she lost custody due to addiction issues. She had struggled with substance abuse for years, but she seemed to have pulled herself together. This thanks to the love and support of her relationship with Kylan. Both Kylan's and Crystal's parents had seen their share of tragedy. Um, we have a situation where sadly one of the parents had lost several children before these horrific murders took place. Once the two became a couple, both Crystal and Kylan seemed really happy and devoted to one another. Crystal worked at the Moab McDonald's, as we already said, and Kylan worked at the Moonflower Community Co-op, where she had been a cashier for four years. There was no one who wished ill will upon the women who were just living their lives together in peace and harmony with nature when they were gunned down. Well, and like you were saying, so they, they're living, it's not really a nomadic lifestyle because they are they do have a, a home base, essentially, is their van. And they have a home base as far as the town goes. And one or one of the ladies has a job for four years. So we have some roots there. When the Grand County deputies arrived at the location where Cindy awaited them, they saw Kylan, and then, unfortunately, they quickly found Crystal's body as well. Crystal lie in the same condition as Kylan. Details of where exactly Crystal lay in relation to Kylan have not been released. All we know is that she was nearby. They had both been shot. They let Cindy go after determining that she was not a suspect. They asked her to take Ruth home, the rabbit. And later she said that Ruth drank four containers of water and ate an entire bowl of greens and innumerable carrots. So this suggesting that the rabbit who was found in a cage likely had not been cared for in quite some time. Yeah, possibly. Or... I, I don't know how feeding rabbits work, but like with Frank, you can give him treats and just keep giving him treats and he's going to keep eating as long as you keep giving him treats. A news release on the Grand County Sheriff's Office Facebook page on August 19th, 2021 stated the following. On August 18th, 2021, the Grand County Sheriff's Office was notified of two deceased females located in the South Mesa area of LaSalle Loop Road in Grand County, Utah. The two deceased individuals were transported to the medical examiner's office to determine the cause of death. The preliminary investigation conducted by the medical examiner's office determined the cause of death to be from gunshot wounds. Investigators with the Grand County Sheriff's Office 
were able to determine the identities of the two deceased females as follows. Crystal Michelle Turner, age 38. Kaylin Carol Schulte, age 24. The immediate families of the victims have been notified of their passing. The Grand County Sheriff's Office would like to express our deepest sympathies and remorse to the victims' families and friends. At this time, the Grand County Sheriff's Office is conducting an ongoing homicide investigation. We are currently following up with any and all leads that come to our attention during this investigation and will continue to be available to people who come forward with information. The Grand County Sheriff's Office believes there is no current danger to the public in the Grand County area. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D-printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. All right, we are back. Cheers, mates, to the windows, to the walls. Notice that the sheriff did not disclose right away the hey. details. Cheers. Cheers. Go. Cheers. Okay, now now you can go. That's the order. I say we're back, and then you cheers. I don't know why you're looking at me funny. Cheers. Okay. Notice that the sheriff did not disclose right away the details of the killings, that right. each woman was shot multiple times. We now know more. The wounds were located on the backs, sides, and or chest of the victims. This was later stated in a, a warrant. But it was immediately clear based on this release that the women had been shot by someone else. This was not a murder-suicide. At this time, the Grand County Sheriff's Office is conducting an ongoing homicide investigation, right. were their words. We now know that this was because no gun was found at the scene. So immediately, no gun. We know that there has to be somebody out there with that gun somewhere. Per KUTV, Sheriff Stephen White said it does not appear to be a murder-suicide, and investigators believe someone else killed the women and fled the area. We do think it was an outside party. There has not been any firearms recovered from that area at this time. But the perplexing part of the release is... The Grand County Sheriff's Office believes there is no current danger to the public in the Grand County area. 
really no danger to the public. What is this about? Exp- expounding on that per WTKR Grand County Sheriff's Office, Captain Shan Hackwell said the evidence that we've gathered at this time, that's what it's led us to believe was an isolated incident, right? An isolated incident. How on earth could they know that? We don't know what they found at the scene or what the scene told them. Yeah, this never makes sense to me. We have two girls murdered in a park. I mean, this happened in Delphi. Two girls murdered in a park, and we are not worried about the public safety. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, this is very similar situation. They're killed at a campsite, and then we have, you know, there's a case out of Rocky River from a couple years ago double homicide at a park in the middle of the day, broad daylight, right. no public, no Don't threat to the general it. public. We saw that in the Barry and Honey Sherman case as well. So it's very common, but again, we don't know what they found at the scene that indicated that to them. If they did, well, know, they that's their... find a note from the killer that says, Oh, by the way, I, I killed these two women and I only kill people I know. So don't worry about it. Correct. But I'm just going off of their words where they say, the evidence that we gathered at this time that led us to that statement of this being an isolated incident. So using their words, I'm simply pointing out, we don't know what they found at the scene. Their words are that something found at the scene made that indication to them. Yeah. So, so I I look when there's a killer on the loose, there's a, there's a possible danger. This guy killed two people. And if unless they caught him, there's there's danger. I don't know why they make that statement. Are both victims found in the same manner? Yes, and so that's why I'm looking at their words and and, and questioning the investigation. I want to know what they're not telling us, and so and many people did want to know what they may not be telling us. What did they see that they're not telling us? So to examine this for a little bit. Many people at the time wondered whether there was some kind of evidence that this was a hate crime, right? Something found at the crime scene that indicated that the murders were either personal or right. some form of hate crime because the the ladies were gay. The state medical examiner conducted autopsies on the women and concluded that the women were each shot multiple times and that shell casings and bullet fragments found at the scene were consistent with the wounds and evidence collected from the bodies of Crystal and Kylan. Furthermore, while the sheriff didn't address this at the time, we know that Kylan and Crystal were both found naked from the waist down. Of course, all of our listeners and all of our true crime minds go right to sexual assault. And that would be a possible motive for the murder. Some depraved predator targeting the women for his own perverse satisfaction and then killing them to prevent the discovery or killing them so that he can, he or they can get away with it. Right. But what's weird here is again, based off of the words of the investigators, even though that's what looks like may have happened, it doesn't appear that that is what happened. This per KSL news, it says grand County Sheriff's captain, Shan Hackwell said Thursday, he did not know if the women were sexually assaulted. Hackwell said detectives are still waiting for final reports and tests to be returned from the Utah office of the medical examiner and state crime lab. But a January 2022 press release from the sheriff's office would later state, well, and clearly state there was no sign of forcible sexual assault of either victim. Right. So what the murderer could have done is it could have been a hate crime and but if I stage it as a sexual assault or sexually motivated crime, then it kind of throws off the public, throws off law enforcement onto who I could be, the identity of the murderer. Yes, exactly. And there, there's, I think that it's not clear based off of the information that they release at the crime scene what the motive would in fact be. Now, right. to me, it's really curious that they go out of their way to use the word forcible in their statement. There was no sign of forcible sexual assault to either victim. So why, why is that forcible word in there? What based off of law in the state of Utah, does that matter? Because we've, and I'm not going to go down this road because I'm very confident that 
some of the victim's family members will probably be listening to this. And so I don't want to go down a road of speculation where it's not really necessary. But just before we move on from that, we have seen other cases. There was a case in, in Maryland that we covered where there were things at the crime scene that indicated to police that, yes, some type of assault that was sexual in nature may have occurred, but it wasn't force. It wasn't forcible sexual assault. And that's what, that was their words at the time because the victim had already been killed. So, you know, without dancing around that too much more. Well, um, way to paint a picture there. Well, so let's talk about the area, the location where this all went down. Moab, Utah is a largely unspoiled natural area with a small town of 5,200 surrounded by incredible national parkland. It is a mecca for mountain bikers, campers, hikers, and tourists, but it remains uncommercialized and untamed. Yeah, it's perfect for hashtag van life. The LaSalle's range where the girls were camping. Now, Captain, it seems like they lived in the van in the winter or the colder months and camped in the summertime. So... The LaSalle's range where the girls were camping is the second highest range in Utah. The campsite set up by Crystal and Kalen where they were killed was not a designated campsite where one signs in with a ranger and is assigned a numbered site. This is what is called dispersed camping. Okay. So you you find a spot that you like. They found a spot next to a drainage ditch and put up a tent. This is allowed as long as it's on public property, which theirs was. So no charge. (laughs) Right. To be specific, their car and tent were found in the South Mesa area of LaSalle Loop Road off FR4651 SS Mesa Road. Estimates are that it was about a 30-minute drive from Moab, which, again, is pretty remote. Seems like a very interesting and adventurous life that they were living. And as said, their campsite was not an official one, but being next to a stream, some shade, this was a good spot for them. Right. So it looks to observers at the scene as though Crystal and Kylan might have been in the process of packing up to leave, to leave that site and move on to another one. And we're basing this off of the rabbit. Ruth was in her travel carrier with no food or water. And we also know that the women had been missing for days, a few days by the time that they are actually located. Cindy mentioned that they were full. There were full Gatorade bottles that were found on the ground at the crime scene. Some were missing labels. And it was her thought that, this site to me looks like they were in the process of packing up and had been interrupted at some point. So the police searched that area. They're processing their crime scene. They later release a press release that states the Grand County Sheriff's Office immediately secured the site and spent the next several days processing the scene. They searched the irrigation ditch both before and after draining the ditch by shutting off the water to the ditch evidence collected at the scene included the victim's tent and personal belongings inside and outside the tent, their vehicle. They found blood shell casings, bullet fragments and video evidence from nearby properties. Within two days, the scene was released. And according to someone on web sleuths, sorry, I don't mean to chuckle, but you can't make some of this stuff up. It's okay. You're known for laughing at funny things. The scene is released in two days. And according to somebody on web sleuths, there were tourists camping in that same spot two days later that had no idea that this horrific event took place. Right. So, but you're saying that they were able to get surveillance footage from local residents and and there might've been possibly trail cams uh, around these campgrounds. That was one of the things that they were, they were looking for. And yes, we're in the process of collecting. There was a large ranch about a half mile away from the scene. This is the Whispering Oaks Ranch. Mm. And we'll get into the timeline here in a bit. I think it's pronounced the Whispering Oaks. But even early on, police knew that the women were likely killed over the weekend. 
The ranch was hosting a wedding that weekend with about 100 guests. And according to locals posting online, there is a direct line of sight from some areas of the ranch compound that overlook the crime scene area, specifically a lodge with a pavilion. Had anyone at the ranch seen or heard anything is what police wanted to know. Gunshot sounds would easily travel that distance in this location. Sheriff's deputies had to canvas everyone at the wedding after obtaining the guest list from the host. They were looking for witnesses. They were looking for photo evidence. Sometimes people are taking photos and they capture something in the background of a photo. They were looking for videos. You know, weddings a place that a lot of people will take a quick video. They wanted anything that would help them to shed some light on what happened to these two women. Yeah, or a social media post. One complicating factor here, Captain, that could have compromised the crime scene was that in the days before Crystal and Kylan were found, there was bad, reportedly bad weather in the area. Right. This is from a a podcast interview with one of the victim's fathers, Sean Paul. The host asked, do you know if there was any DNA, fingerprints, or even tire tracks that were found at the scene? He's asking about evidence. And Sean Paul says, no, tire tracks, I can tell you no on that. Same as boot tracks or footprints. And he goes on to say that this is because they weren't found until five days of rain and hail, till after five days of rain and hail. And then as far as other evidence goes, Captain, Sean Paul posted on Facebook, their evidence is on a complete total lockdown. They won't tell me anything at all about DNA fingerprints, gun ballistics, any of it. They're super tight-lipped about it. Well, one thing I think law enforcement has going for them and and then the loved ones of these ladies is that they did have three vehicles and they would move around these vehicles and basically, like you were saying, storing the vehicles in a public spot where people would be able to see those. So we'd have at least eyewitnesses of you know, the girls and their actions and the the actions of these vehicles. So let's, let's dive into um, Kylan and Crystal's timeline. Yeah. Police set out trying to figure out what were the last steps of the women trying to nail down when exactly they were killed. So we know that they were found on the 18th and they were believed to have been dead for a few days at that time. When had they last been seen? That's what we want to know. Well, there was some confusion, but it sounds like investigators eventually settled on a date of Friday the 13th, and they have a specific event on that day too. This takes place at Woody's Tavern in Moab. This is from, the following is from the Daily Beast that reported the couple who got married in April, they're talking about our two missing and then later found murdered women, were semi-regular customers at Woody's Tavern in Moab, said bar manager Ariel Beck. They weren't big drinkers, said Beck, explaining that they came in maybe once or twice a month. They showed up at the bar around 6 p.m. on Friday, August 13th, and left around 9 p.m., She went on to say that she didn't see anyone but a Kayla Borza and another friend speak to Schulte and that that night nobody followed them out the door when they left. She goes on to say that they left around 8.30 p.m. Well, there's more uh, of that story and, and a possible lead from that story. So it sounds to me, Captain, that the night's events were... Pretty much like this. Crystal and Kylan, they're going to meet up with their friend, Kayla Borza, and another friend. And they're going to spend a couple hours having some casual drinks and catching up. Shooting the breeze, right? And actually, the Daily Beast has surveillance footage, uh, you know, silent video footage that you can see of all of the girls sitting and talking and laughing. It looks like a typical, very typical Friday evening, Friday night kind of hangout situation, but it's what the women told Kayla that stood out to investigators later. Now the surveillance video obtained by the daily beast shows a slain Utah couple at a local tavern the night before they disappeared, laughing and chatting with friends to whom 
they complained about a, quote, weirdo camping near them in the wilderness. And the friend goes on to say, we were just having a great time, having a couple of drinks, and all they said was there was a creep staying next to them. Caleb Borza was one of the last people to see Kylan Schulte, age 24, and Crystal Beck, age 38, alive. And she says, and that was it. Borza said that the women didn't seem overly frightened. They were more just discussing the creepy guy, kind of laughing about it. But there is indication that after that, the women became increasingly distressed about the creep. The following is from KSL.com. They had a review of some of the documents that were filed by law enforcement captain. This is from a search warrant affidavit filed in the 7th District Court that says the women were last seen on Friday, August 13, about 8.30 p.m., leaving Woody's Tavern on Main Street in Moab. They drove to a campsite in the LaSalle Mountains. At some point during the weekend, friends say the women called to inform others that they were moving to a different campsite because of a weirdo nearby who was, quote, freaking them out. Investigators were informed that Kylan had mentioned to her friends that if something happened to them, they were murdered. Kylan had continued by saying there was a creepy man around their camp and they had been intimidated by him. There are some reports that there are texts from one or both of the women's phones saying that the creep was camping near them and was making them uncomfortable and they were thinking of moving. And we really don't know whether they did move since we only know where they were found, not where they had started out. Right. But clearly there was a man in the woods or in the area whom the woman could see and possibly even interacted with who was, quote, creeping them out. And Kylan had even gone so far to joke about being murdered to her friend. But the other issue is packing up and unpacking look very similar. That is true. That's absolutely true. So the way that I, I don't know the full details of this man who's creeping them out other than what they stated here. Yeah. Oh, creepo. The only other story that I heard was that one of the nights they, it, this is after dark, they are not in their tent sleeping. They are on a hammock. And I, I'm guessing that they were awake or something startled one of them to, to, to wake them up. But the way that the, that story goes is that at some point on one of the nights, they're in the hammock and they see the man like walking through their campsite. Now, I didn't get any better description of that. You know, did they see him like look in their tent or looking at their you know, going through their objects, their items or, or anything at their campsite from the way that the story goes is he was unaware that they were in the hammock that he likely thought that they were still in their tent. Right. But they have this vehicle and they have their tents out and it's obviously that they have their space. It's also obvious that there's a lot of space around them. So for him to even walk that close, even close to their campsite is right. kind of a no, no when you're camping. Yes. Yeah, exactly. This is, this is not a spot. If, if in fact they're having these problems at the spot that they're later found, this is not a place that they're surrounded by other campers that you would, you would almost be forced to walk through somebody's campsite. Right. Like you said, it's obvious they're camping there. It would be obvious to not walk through somebody's campsite. Now, when this story first broke, everyone assumed that the women were killed at their campsite Friday night after returning from Woody's Tavern. They had talked about moving their campsite to their friend that night. And for from the scene, it looked as though they were getting ready to pack up or were in the middle of packing up. But as the captain say, says, and I agree, packing up and unpacking look very similar. The middle of the night seems like the logical time, however, for the murder out in the open, but this was not disclosed until January of 2022. Investigators narrowed down the date of the double murder to be that of Saturday the 14th. And I know it's a remote area. I mean, it's a campsite. I mean, by definition, it's a remote area, but... 
you would think that somebody would have heard these gunshots because there was multiple gunshots fired. And that just may be the case. So when we learn of investigators narrowing down the date of the double murder to Saturday the 14th, the way that that works is that a private investigator working pro bono with Sean Paul, with one of the victim's fathers, appeared on a show called Closing Arguments with Vinnie Politan on the Court TV network. The private investigator, his name is Jason Jensen, shared some new information stating that investigators were now focusing in on a late morning, the late morning of Saturday the 14th, the day after the women were seen at Woody's Tavern, stating that rumors that there were rumors that at 11.35 a.m. there were gunshots and screams that were heard. Jensen said that he got his information from a, quote, reliable source saying that they, meaning the authorities, had audio of the shooting with the sounds of gunshots and screams reported at 11.35 on the morning of August 14th, which is that Saturday. So after that segment aired, the Grand County Sheriff's Office did confirm this. They came forward and reported to ABC4 News saying, yes, we do have audio recordings from the area with some gunshots on August 14th. But they go on to say, I am not going to say the specific time, but let's say it was in the a.m. We can't specifically say if those gunshots are related to our homicide. So the officer would not address whether the screams were heard and he would not elaborate on how they possibly had or acquired these audio recordings in the first place. We can speculate it could have been somebody at the wedding a half mile away recording something and the shots are captured on their audio. Right. Or, Which would give you the time. Yeah. Time frame. Or, or, or did the phone that was found at the scene did it possibly contain audio? No one was saying at the time, but of course this mm. is very a very intriguing development to this investigation because if Jensen is correct, then there were gunshots at 11.35 a.m., meaning that the women were killed in public in broad daylight. This does change things. It makes it a much more brazen crime, a more likely you know, more likely that there would have been a tourist dash cam or some kind of sighting of a vehicle speeding away from the area. This might help with potentially more ear witnesses or eyewitnesses to somebody fleeing the area. So we have eyewitnesses and friends that saw them at Woody's Tavern the night before, but it seems like we have some evidence that they also woke up that next morning and probably went into town for something and then came back before they were viciously murdered. Right. So this is this is expanding on the idea that it's not just the audio of these gunshots at 11.35 a.m. that might be leading investigators to believe that they were killed on the morning of the 14th. And so this last little bit of information was uncovered by the private investigators stating that the women had driven back into town and had ridden their motorcycle around. So and then parking it back at the McDonald's before hopping in the Kia and going out to wherever they were camping at the time. And so the investigator goes on to say that they were seen because they were pulled over. They had a lighthearted conversation. They were bragging that uh, Kalen learned how to drive the motorcycle. So this is, it, it seems like it's a little bit of an unconfirmed sighting, but it would seem pretty official if they were pulled over and had some kind of conversation with uh, someone from law enforcement. Right. So just to recap here quickly, captain, the women were at Woody's tavern on Friday night until about eight 30 or so. And then they presumably returned to their campsite. The next morning they went into town. This is unconfirmed by law enforcement. They must have returned to the campsite where they were killed at 1135 AM by an unknown person. At least this is what we think happened.
And we're just getting started with this case, so make sure you join us back here tomorrow in the garage. Same bat time, same bat channel. And until tomorrow. Be good, be kind, and don't look. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Can 3D printed life-size organ models help to map out complex surgeries ahead of time? Is it possible? It already is right here. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go.